This episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN and HelloFresh. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today, oh boy, do I have a topic for you all. So this one was requested in my Discord server and at first I honestly did not believe this at all. So I was just kind of like, mm, this can't be real. But after looking into it, apparently it was true. And I guess you guys can tell from the title alone that this is going to be a very, very interesting video. I am almost 100% certain it's going to be demonetized. So please leave this video a like to give it an algorithm push, please. But today we're going to be talking about the KKK themselves. Yes, like the KKK. Um, they apparently once had an MLM type structure as part of their business model, I suppose. MLMs are awful and the KKK is awful. And this ungodly combination is something I never expected to see. So let's go ahead and start with the article and then dig a little deeper into what happened here. So let's start with the article that was sent to me that kicked off this entire situation. Today, the Ku Klux Klan is one of the most extreme and reviled symbols of American racism. But there was once a time when the fringe hate group verged on mainstream. In the 1920s, its members numbered in the millions and made up a significant percentage of the US population. This is the KKK that claimed to control elections and counted US presidents among its members. And it's the predecessor to the group that in fiction threatened Atticus Finch in the front of the steps of the Maycomb County Courthouse for defending a black man. But in 2011, Roland G. Fryer and Stephen D. Levitt, the economist co-author of Freakonomics, looked into historical statistics about KKK membership and demographics, criminal and political trends at the time. And they found something surprising, a seldom side scene of the KKK. Rather than a terrorist organization, they wrote, the 1920s Klan is best described as a social organization with a wildly successful multi-level marketing structure. According to Fryer and Levitt in its heyday, the KKK was a giant perverse pyramid scheme. Instead of perpetuating a racist agenda, the KKK's leaders exploited pre-existing popular racism to make money. They were very, very, very successful. At a time when per capita income in the US was under $700, the Indiana Klan leader pulled in about $200,000 annually. In 2015, that's equivalent to more than $2.8 million. And just with that opener right there, I'm already left a bit speechless. The thing is, an MLM is about making money from signups. A company with salespeople isn't an MLM. YouTube itself isn't an MLM. Girl Scouts isn't an MLM. I've heard and seen a lot of strange accusations made in the comment section where people go, well, this is a shady company, therefore it must be an MLM. So to clarify, it's a company or a pyramid scheme that makes it impossible for employees to actually earn a living without having a downline. I went over this a bit in my Herbalife videos because Ackerman, a businessman that's gone up against Herbalife in the past, explains how Herbalife is set up this way during the Betting on Zero documentary. So I'm sure right now some of you are questioning how the KKK could have been an MLM if they didn't have products. Well, back in the 1920s, they weren't only just cultish and evil, but they had their own sort of like a product line, so to speak. Mainstream even, as I mentioned a moment ago. This is attributed to their disturbing rise in popularity at the time. So before I can really address their so-called products and what they were selling, I'm going to talk a little bit about how they got their following during the 1920s in the first place. I mean, I know why Hunbots fall for smelly essential oils, but how did someone buy into them, right? Well, the KKK actually started in 1865. I'm not gonna go very deep into their history here because that would be an entirely separate video in of itself, and it might even be just a tad too dark at times, honestly. The point is they became synonymous with terroristic acts pretty early on in their history. In January, 1891, 500 masked members attacked a Union County jail and lynched eight prisoners, the same year that Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act. 
On April 20th, 1871, the House approved an act to enforce the provisions of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and for other purposes, known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. The Ku Klux Klan Act, the third of a series of increasingly stringent enforcement acts, was designed to eliminate extra-legal violence and protect the civil and political rights of four million freed slaves. The 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868, defined citizenship and guaranteed due process and legal protection of the law to all. Vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan, however, freely threatened African-Americans and their white allies in the South and undermined the Republican Party's plan for reconstruction. The bill authorized the president to intervene in the formal rebel states that attempted to deny any person or any class of persons of the equal protection of the laws or of equal privileges or immunities under the laws. These enforcement acts, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the constitution were meant to empower the president to protect African-Americans. Now, it's not as if the Klan, or at least its sentiments died completely, but by 1876, the South was under democratic control again, and the amendments had, at least to some extent, served their purpose, but it really didn't last. In 1915, white Protestant nativists organized a revival of the Ku Klux Klan near Atlanta, Georgia, inspired by their romantic view of the Old South, as well as Thomas Dixon's 1905 book, The Klansman, and D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation. This second generation of the Klan was not only anti-Black, but also took a stand against Roman Catholics, Jews, foreigners, and organized labor. It was fueled by growing hostility to the surge in immigration that America experienced in the early 20th century, along with fears of communist revolution akin to the Bolshevik triumph in Russia in 1917. The organization took as its symbol a burning cross and held rallies, parades, and marches around the country. At its peak in the 1920s, Klan membership exceeded 4 million people nationwide. The Great Depression in the 1930s depleted the ranks and the organization temporarily disbanded in 1944. They sort of revived again in the 60s and have been around ever since, though their numbers are far smaller with an estimated 3,000 members in 2017. Now, 3,000 is still disgusting, obviously, but I'm grateful it's not 4 million like it used to be. And sure, it doesn't feel like we've made much improvement when it comes to the number of hate groups because those seem to climb higher and higher, but moving on. This is the KKK era we're going to be talking about today. Not the KKK of the 1860s, but the 1960s onward. But that revival era in the 1920s when they had an MLM and cult structure kind of surrounding them. So let's take a look at it. So let's take a quick break and talk about today's sponsors. Today's video was sponsored by ExpressVPN. So here on the channel, we talk about a lot of sketchy, uncomfortable, and just weird topics in general, like, you know, today's. And let me tell you, my search history, it gets really, really sketchy from time to time because of the research that goes into these videos. And I definitely don't want someone just being able to casually see that and think like, I'm some kind of super weirdo or something like this is research. And I know, why don't I just use incognito mode? Well, I learned something about that and that incognito mode doesn't actually hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your ISP can still see every single website you've ever visited, which makes me mildly uncomfy. So that's why whenever I'm home, I am always going online with ExpressVPN. It doesn't matter where you can get your internet from. ISPs in the US can legally sell your information to ad companies. And I most certainly do not wanna be advertised to things that I research in these videos. And that's where ExpressVPN steps in. It's an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. And it's available on all your devices, phones, computers, even your smart TV. So there's really no excuse for you to not use it. So make sure you protect your online activity today with a VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com MLM, and you can receive an extra three months for free of a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com MLM, expressvpn.com MLM to learn more. This episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh. Now, along with us being stuck at home literally all the time right now, I also don't wanna go outside into our current global situation and just even go to the grocery store. 
That's where HelloFresh is stepping in. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. They offer over 23 recipes every single week, including a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients so that you'll never get bored. I choose to do a little bit of everything in each of my delivery boxes, so it's a surprise every single time. I don't 100% know what I'm getting, but I know it's going to be good. And what's best about this is I am not cooking inclined as a human, so I really like that everything is pre-portioned and easily laid out with very easy to follow directions because Lord knows that's what I need so I don't burn a whole kitchen down. And HelloFresh does that and makes me feel competent for just about 30 minutes or less inside the kitchen, which is about all I can truly handle. So if you're ready to start 2021 right, make sure to go to hellofresh.com MLM10 and use code MLM10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. If you're like me and struggling to learn how to cook, or perhaps you're a seasoned chef just looking for a different spin on a new type of meal, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash MLM10 and use code MLM10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. And now that we've talked about how to protect your internet security and how to make a delicious meal, let's get back to making ourselves very uncomfortable with the rest of today's video. In December of 1920, the KKK hired a PR film, the Southern Publicity Association to boost recruitment. The firm had previously represented the Salvation Army and the Anti-Saloon League, but it was close to bankruptcy. The incentives in the contract were good, possibly too good. Simmons had always made money off his Klansmen. He sold them $6 robes and Klan branded life insurance policies at $53,000 a pop. He also charged his members $10 initiation fees. According to the contract, the Southern Publicity Association would get 80% of this initiation fee for every new member it signed up. When the Southern Publicity Association signed on, the full initiation fee was still $10, roughly equivalent to $125 in 2015. 80% of the fee was $8 and roughly equivalent to $100. This meant the Southern Publicity Association could offer salesmen an attractive commission while keeping a substantial cut. The Southern Publicity Association quickly built and deployed a national sales force of over 1,000 Kleagles, the KKK's name for its commission paid salesmen. Every time a Kleagle recruited a new member called a ghoul, the Kleagle earned $4 of the $10 initiation fee. At first, the Southern Publicity Association sent $2 of the remaining six to Simmons, pocketed $2.50 and handed $1.50 to a regional supervisor called the Great Goblin. And I, what the fuck am I reading? Like, what are these names? I, I know this is like a serious, like and fucked up kind of thing, but I just, the Great Goblin, God. But seriously, I'm not joking here. The KKK, actually hired a PR firm and operated quite similarly to an MLM by giving monetary incentives to those that signed people up. I mean, according to one source, this actually made them less effective as a hate group, so that's kind of interesting too. Like, as much as I hate pyramid schemes, now that the KKK has entered the picture, I guess I have a little less hate for pyramid schemes because now a pyramid scheme that's also the KKK has taken its place for the new most hated thing here. Still, the numbers from this newer article are absolutely fucking insane. They state that during a time when most of the US made less than $700 a year, a KKK leader in Indiana made $200,000 annually. And even for today's standards, that's a lot of money. He and other leaders managed it through clever marketing and the invention of all kinds of ways to make money off their own members, a classic trait of a pyramid scheme. For instance, the Klan charged members a $10 initiation fee and Fryer and Levitt provided the breakdown. $4 to the salesman, $2.50 to the PR firm, $2 to the clan self-declared grand wizard, William Simmons, and $1.50 to a regional supervisor, again, the grand goblin. So instead of calling their downline coaches or consultants or whatever MLM term you've heard used, these KKK downlines were called grand wizards, Kleagles, and goblins for their titles. This just sounds like a really, really, really bad game of D&D that went horrifically off the rails. I don't even know if I can feel like I can really call them like Hunbots like we traditionally do, because I think that kind of cheapens it and makes light of the reality of the situation here. But the KKK literally made a business out of hate. I don't know why that shocks me after everything I've seen, 
like covered time and time again, but it still does. The article continues and states, and it didn't stop with initiation fees. The clan leaned on members to buy robes and robe cleaning, along with clan branded life insurance accessories, Bibles, and even candy. The clan petered out as a genuine national force in the 1940s. The feds got them for back taxes, but small KKK groups are still out there. And according to Vice, some are using candy as a recruiting tool rather than a moneymaker. Residents of Coleman City, Arkansas recently received KKK flyers packaged with Tootsie Rolls and lollipops. Authorities there are investigating the not so original scheme. In November, Anonymous exposed hundreds of suspected KKK members. Since these articles are from 2015, I'm sure this is old news to come to you. And again, we're not really focusing on today's era of the KKK, but it's still insane to me thinking of the actual literal KKK using candy as an incentive for recruits. They had all the hallmarks of a pyramid scheme too. An expert witness from the FTC went up against the MLM success by health earlier this year. And in their testimony, they compared MLMs to the KKK, arguing about their dangerous nature. Stacy Bosley, an expert witness, is a Hamley Associate Professor of Economics, and she's also testified against Vema and Verve. Here's what she has to say about the topic. According to a 2012 study by Roland Fryer of Harvard and Stephen Levitt of the University of Chicago, the KKK was driven in part by financial incentives that were similar to those in modern multi-level marketing organizations. New recruits paid to join the organization and were paid for recruiting additional members. Fryer and Levitt contend that many joined to have an opportunity to earn potential financial benefits of membership. In the same way, pyramid scheme participants pay to join and are incentivized to recruit other participants. Now, at the time of the interview where I found my information about Professor Bosley, this was only peer reviewed research that as Hamline puts it, provided a theoretical economic model of an organization with recruitment awards. No other similarities between pyramid schemes and other recruitment based groups is intended. And I can understand that. I mean, if someone gets a bonus or a referral award, again, that doesn't mean a company is automatically an MLM. There's apps out there and even banks that offer you money when you refer a friend. That doesn't just make them a pyramid scheme, but when you can make a living wage from just insisting people sign up to be your Herbalife downline or sign up to be one of your coaches or be part of your hateful, sheet swearing, disturbing, evil cult. Well, I think it's crossing into, you know, pyramid scheme territory. Let's not forget those wages after all and how much money people made from referring their friends. Because that is a thing I have to consider now that this is being made. Now, the high estimate may have been 4 million people in the KKK in 1924. And even on the low end around that same time, it was 1.5 million people there was a disgusting opportunity for these KKK downlines. So at least the Great Depression was good for one thing when it helped temporarily disband these people later on. Not to mention the titles on these charts that I'm looking at and their recruiting structures are hilariously laughable. We've got ghouls at members, Kleagles above it, then King Kleagle, then Great Goblin, then Imperial Kleagle and Imperial Wizard, and then Grand Wizard. But I think that's about the only hilarious part of this is the naming. The product they were selling was straight up hatred, ignorance, and racism. And for a while, clan leaders at the state level were among the best paid in America. Fryer and Livet study says, the single state of Indiana generated nearly $4 million in revenues for the national headquarters. After some modest expenses, most of that revenue would go directly to the Imperial Wizard. The head of the Indiana clan received nearly $2.5 million annually from the state's operations. The head of the state's sales hierarchy pocketed nearly $400,000 a year. To put these numbers into perspective in current dollars, a typical full professor during this time earned $45,000 in current dollars, Babe Ruth earned $613,000, and President Calvin Coolidge earned $885,000. However, as Fryer and Livet state, the true genius of the KKK at that time lay in its uncanny ability to raise revenue. 
They were so busy raising money that a lot of the hate crimes and systematic bigotry of the 1920s weren't really caused or impacted by the KKK. In addition, they didn't last. This sort of defunct MLM slash like homegrown terrorist group lost a lot of support very quickly and for a multitude of reasons. The KKK's popular collapse came in 1924 and 1925. D.C. Stefferson, the Grand Dragon of Indiana and several other states was a charismatic figure considered largely responsible for the KKK's widespread popularity in his home state. Fryer and Leavitt estimate Klan membership in Indiana at almost 19% of the eligible population, nearly one in every five. But America would soon discover that D.C. Stephenson was not the squeaky clean, Protestant, prohibitionist, nationalist, white supremacist he claimed to be. In 1925, Stephenson was tried and convicted of the rape and murder of Mage Olberholzer, a young state employee. Following her abuse by Stephenson, Olbenholzer had received medical attention too late to save her life. But she told all in a signed statement on her deathbed. The judge found that Stephenson had kidnapped Olberholzer, forced her to drink liquor, raped and physically abused her and caused her death. When the Stephenson scandal broke, members fled the KKK in droves. By 1930, national KKK membership was back down to 30,000 members. And you know, color me just a bit shocked here. Like who would have known a member of the KKK wasn't a good person? Who could have guessed that or seen that coming? But Seriously, the Klan was all about hating African-Americans, Catholics, Jews, and foreigners at that time. According to PBS, the Klan promoted fundamentalism and a devout patriotism along with advocating white supremacy. They blasted bootleggers, motion pictures, and espoused a return to clean living. Appealing to folks uncomfortable with the shifting nature of America from a rural agricultural society to an urban industrial nation, the Klan attacked the elite, urbanites, and intellectuals. As hateful as they were to outsiders, the Klan was very tight-knit. And I mean, that is what happens when you're kind of this weird cultish terrorist organization, MLM thing, I suppose. So Madge, who was white, grew up in Indiana, grew up in a Protestant church. She was everything the KKK would defend. If she had been Catholic, Jewish, African-American, Latina, Asian, pretty much any other race or religion really, then I'm not so sure the KKK would have lost so much support as it did, to be honest. Another article suggests the reason the KKK began to lose power in the 1920s was because the vision of an America decaying from foreign ideologies, dangerous immigrants, and moral not never came into being. The post-World War I recession eased in by the middle of the 1920s and the American economy boomed again. Labor disputes that Klansmen warned came from communist agitation faded. Black migration proceeded without causing massive unrest and social revolution. Immigration restrictions passed in 1924 limited the number of people arriving from Eastern Europe and the age of the flapper moved ahead whether moralists liked it or not. Amidst it all, white native born Protestants still retained the lion's share of power in the United States and they did not need the Klan to hold it. Even without the Klan, the nation remained a place where prejudice against ethnic and religious minorities was widespread and where black Americans in particular suffered legalized discrimination and deadly violence. Still, there was something especially disturbing about a United States in which bigotry's appeal had become so public and widespread that it could be taken for granted and where its purveyors could feel entirely comfortable expressing it through such seemingly virtuous activities. In a country that normalized the Ku Klux Klan, it hardly mattered whether every white American felt the organization's allure. Sizable percentages of them probably wanted nothing to do directly with the Klan at all. But if they were not interested in watching the parade go by, they mostly just looked the other way. And personally, I feel like the KKK at the time operated as many, you know, kind of terrorist groups do. It's out of fear. The KKK, scummy as they were, and scummy is such an understatement here, managed to monetize actual fear in mass. 
at that time, Americans were worried about immigration, foreigners with different or unknown ideals and religions from their own, that whole thing. And when their fears weren't realized, but just unfounded, the KKK lost a lot of hold it had on people. Obviously, I'm not saying they went away completely, but their numbers did dwindle significantly. And simply because they're an MLM and since, you know, MLMs don't ever play by the rules, as it turns out, the KKK also owed about $685,000 in back taxes. So, you know, that doesn't help the case either. The US Treasury apparently sued the KKK for this money in April, 1944, and to settle the case, they disbanded. So that's how that actually happened. They just didn't wanna pay their taxes. So they were just like, okay, lol, we're not a thing anymore then. Now, before we conclude today's episode, I know the numbers we talked about today have been really, really depressing. That many people, 1.5 to 4 million people in the KKK, it's eye-opening and I think it really speaks volumes to what happens when hatred, fear, and downright racist behavior control people. So to end today's video, I'm going to quote a speech from Calvin Coolidge, the president during the 1920s and much of the time frame we talked about today, because it's relevant today and I feel like maybe it's a somewhat lighter note to end on. Plus, you know, it's good to see a president rebuking groups like this openly. Whether one traces his Americanism back three centuries to the Mayflower or three years of steerage, is not half so important as whether his Americanism of today is real and genuine. No matter by what various crafts we came here, we are all now in the same boat. It doesn't matter where you came from, we're all on the same boat. I think that's something we probably should think of a little bit more nowadays. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. And I can't really say I hope you enjoyed it, but I absolutely hope that you did learn something today. Please make sure to hit that like button if you did. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe. If you want to see more content from me, you can pop open my description box. You're going to find all the sources I use to create today's video, as well as all the links to my social media, other projects, etc., etc. So with that being said, that's where I'm ending today's video. Thank you for making it. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.